Hi, I'm Dr. Harry Witchell from Brighton and Sussex Medical School. This physiology screencast shows how to answer an exam style question. It's an advanced level question and the question is as follows. Draw a positive feedback loop showing how slowing gut transit time can lead to constipation, again, by an increase, uh, ever increasing cycles via positive feedback. Then, for the second part of the question, it asks you to draw a negative feedback loop showing how adding fiber to the diet will lead to an increase in gut transit time, thereby resolving the constipation. The film is organized in two sections. In section one, it will show exactly how to answer the question. In part two, it will show a more abstract discussion of how positive and negative feedback systems are meant to be drawn on an exam situation. This is an advanced level exam style question. And if you were able to demonstrate this exam question correctly, then it would demonstrate for you a high level of competence for understanding both positive and negative feedback systems, as well as understanding the overall structure of gut transit and motility. So in order to show how slowing the gut transit time leads to constipation via a positive feedback loop, I'm going to start here with our essential condition, the parameter, which is gut transit time. And I'm going to draw an arrow, which is going to represent the slowness of the gut transit time. So that's our beginning. And that slow gut transit time will lead to a physical result, which is going to be a change in the water resorption. So the water resorption is going to be increased because of the slow gut transit time. This increase in water resorption will lead to a physical effect, which is very compact stool. This compact stool is ultimately the beginning of the problem of constipation. The compact stool will have an effect on the sensor, and this is the beginning of our physiological response. This compact stool will lead to a decrease in the firing or the activity of the stretch receptors which is in the wall of the gut. This decrease in the sensor activity will be sent by the nervous system to the nearby effectors and the effectors are the muscle cells. So the gut smooth muscle will have a decreased activity This decreased activity in gut smooth muscle is going to ultimately result in decreased gut motility. And that decreased gut motility, which is the final physical result, is essentially the return of our negative feedback loop, the return of our positive feedback loop, which leads to an increase in gut transit time. And in order for that, to work as an answer on the exam. First of all, you must have a complete circle. It must circle back to the initial condition. You must draw a positive sign to show that this is a positive feedback loop, and you should be able to see that you go from your initial parameter, which is gut transit time, through a physical result, increased water resorption, to compact stool, the physical result, which leads to the sensor, which is a decrease in stretch receptor activity, then the effector, which is a decrease in uh, gut smooth muscle activity, and finally the ultimate physical result, which is a decrease in gut motility. Having just shown how slowing gut transit time can lead to constipation via a positive feedback loop, now we approach the second part of the question, which is how adding fiber to the diet can lead to a regularization of gut transit time via a negative feedback loop. So we begin again at our initial parameter, which is here, gut transit time. Now, in this case, we're going to make our perturbation via fiber. So we add fiber to the diet, and that will lead to an increase in water retention. 
This water retention in the stool will lead to larger stools. So an increase in stool size. These increased stools will actually have an effect directly on the wall of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. And the effect on the wall will lead to a change in the sensor activity. That means we'll have an increase in the activity of stretch receptors. This increased stretch receptor activity will lead to the effector organ, which is the gut smooth muscle. And there will be an increase in smooth muscle activity. And that's in the gut. This increase in smooth muscle activity will ultimately lead to a physical effect, which is an increase in net motility inside the gut. And this increase in gut motility is essentially the regularization of our gut transit time problem. So now we've, we've actually created a negative feedback loop that leads to an increased transit time. So once again recapping, by adding fiber to the diet, that leads to a physical effect, which is increased water retention inside of the gastrointestinal tract. That leads to an increase in stool size. And it's the increased stool size which leads to the change in the sensor, which means that there is an increase in stretch receptor activity. That's followed up by the effector organ, which is the increase in gut smooth muscle activity, and ultimately that's regularized by the increase in motility. So again, you have to have a complete circle to have a full marks for this, positive, this negative feedback loop. You must draw that it goes back to the initial condition using an arrow, and you must draw a minus sign here for the negative feedback loop. And all that should take about two minutes for the first feedback loop and about a minute for the second. In this part of the screencast, what I'd like to show you is a general or abstract way of looking at feedback loops, all feedback loops, both positive and negative feedback loops, and for any system which either is something like the hypothalamus or anything in the gastrointestinal system. So all feedback loops begin with an initial condition. And this could be a parameter like blood pressure or heart rate. That initial condition will, according to the exam question, be perturbed. So there will be a perturbation. And this perturbation could be any change at all from raising blood pressure to lowering heart rate or changing gut motility time. This perturbation will have a physical result. And the, the physical result could be anything from things getting larger, smaller, stretched out, whatever. And the physical result begins the actual physiological feedback loop, really, because the physical result is going to be detected by either a sensor or a receptor. It's the sensor or receptor, which could be either a neural cell or an endocrine cell, that begins the real process of the body responding to the change or perturbation. The sensor or receptor then sends a signal to an effector organ. An effector organ would be anything from uh, muscle, or it could be another endocrine cell. The effector organ, once it actually performs its process, will lead to a physical result. That's the ultimate response. This physical result, which is the final step, essentially, of the feedback loop, should relate back to the initial condition or parameter that's being measured. In order to score full marks on the examination, you must draw an arrow back from the final physical result back to the initial condition. 
And that arrow must be accompanied by either a plus sign in the case of a positive feedback loop, or in the case of a negative feedback loop, it should have a negative sign, where the positive sign demonstrates that the feedback leads to a more extreme initial condition versus the negative feedback loop where there's compensation. So just going back over those steps again, you start with an initial condition, then there's a perturbation. This perturbation leads to a physical result, and the physical result is detected at the physiological level by a sensor or receptor. That leads to an effector organ, a signal going to the effector organ, which responds, that's the physiological response, which leads to a physical result relating back to the initial condition. Just a final word that you should remember that drawing feedback loops is not an absolutely exact rigid process. That is, that in a feedback loop you don't have to start necessarily all the way on the step to the left. You can start at the top, at the bottom, any which way you like. You can also draw your feedback loop going either clockwise or anti-clockwise. That shouldn't make a difference at all. In fact, you can even draw feedback loops which don't necessarily have just six steps. You can have some that will have more than six steps, others that will have less. Even in the feedback loops that I've just drawn for you on the gastrointestinal system, those feedback loops could conceivably be drawn in different ways. You could have those feedback loops with either five steps or six steps. And the important thing is that you include the correct words. The words that you include must demonstrate that you've remembered all of the aspects of the physiological response. Those aspects would include both the physical result from the perturbation, as well as the sensor and the effector organ, and ultimately the physical result of the effector organ. So long as you remember all these different aspects, you'll be able to more than successfully demonstrate the physiological aspects of that feedback loop and hopefully get full marks for that exam question.